countries do immigration and cities do integration. Uh, and it really is cities and communities where refugees locate to or um, are located to. And it is cities and communities where refugees will thrive or not. And in the context of really the largest refugee crisis and mobility crisis since the Second World War, the quality of welcome in cities really becomes both a moral and a strategic imperative. How has this city responded to the arrival of thousands of refugees in the last three months? Tell us the good, the bad, and the ugly. Early on, before um, even the, the change in government, um, the city of Toronto was very eager uh, to help. And when we launched uh, Lifeline Syria in June, uh, the mayor was you know, one of the first citizens that said, I'm on board, how can I help? How can we get the city involved? Um, and he also challenged mayors across the country to also step up and uh, sponsor um, refugees through, through private sponsorship programs. So uh, a city of Toronto created the Refugee Resettlement Program. Um, so that sees City Hall coordinating municipal services with community-based settlement services, um, as well as enhancing uh, community-based support with council-directed resources. Um, also, of course, the public played a huge role um, in the resettlement of, of the refugees. And the amount of collaboration through, between the private and the public sector and from the public uh, population, really, it has been amazing and I think has made all the difference um, in the success, or what I hope will be the successful resettlement. So they're all sitting around the same table instead of working in silos. Um, and so that's been amazing to see. Um, of course, there's bad and problems in, in our systems. Um, I think stress on system brings the best and worst uh, of a system. But the, the beautiful thing about crisis is that it creates the opportunity to do things differently. And Rachel, over to you next. Um, you work to create welcoming cities. Can you tell us a little bit about what you can describe as the personality of a welcoming city? What does that mean? Hmm. So for us, a welcoming city is a place of full equity, opportunity, inclusion. Um, it's not a place of just tolerance. And I think if we want to get to that, we have to think about how we focus not just on delivering services, but really um, engaging with the community in a different kind of way um, to create that sense that anyone can belong there, um, anyone can be a new Atlantan or a new Torontan. Mm -hmm. But the most important one is uh, really conveying this idea that when we talk about welcoming, it's about everyone. Um, so it's really critically important um, as we think about how to create uh, the policies that reduce all the barriers that people face um, and a culture of welcoming that we really lean into this question of um, empathy for all of the people in a community who need to be part of that equation. Jim, tell us how you actually organize a community um, to begin doing this, mounting this effort of receiving 50 Syrian refugee families, which as we know is um, many, many more than 50 individual people. What we have is we've set up a director of housing, a director of jobs, director of health, director of education, all the different directors, um, and then they have their teams that work for them. So every Syrian family that comes in gets an Arabic-speaking mentor family and an English-speaking mentor family. And then we do a scorecard. So every two weeks, you're doing a scorecard to say, are they adjusting properly? Do they need an ESL tutor? Do, are they happy with their job? What, what education do they need? What training do they need? Rachel, I'm going to turn it to you next and um, address what maybe some people in the room might be thinking about, which is why even have someone from the United States on a panel about refugees in cities. Um, there's a statistic that came out in Canada. Uh, I think it was at the two-month mark Canada had received um, sorry, the two-month mark of bringing in 25,000 Syrians, um, Canada had received more refugees than the United States had during the course of the crisis. Um, so I suppose the question is, if you, if you're, if you can answer it, um, what do you think is behind that? Uh, I mean, we, I think it's fair to say we know politics is behind it, but given your insight, is there anything else behind it? I mean, hearts and minds, what else is going on in the United States? Despite those numbers, there has been a major effort in the United States um, to really uh, engage on this from an advocacy perspective and try to increase the numbers and the resettlement. But I think what we've all come to realize now is, is at the root of um, a lot of the fear um, and concern that's driving it that are outside of the fact that we're just in a um, heated political cycle 
um, is that there is uh, a lot more that we can be doing um, to be proactive in, in communities um, around the perceptions of refugees and the perceptions of new people in general. But there are a whole lot of cities um, that have really acted as a firewall against a lot of the political vitriol um, and have really stood up and said, no, actually, please send us more refugees. You know, this is good for our city. We want refugee resettlement here. Um, and those are very diverse places. I mean, from Clarkston, Georgia to Detroit, Michigan, um, we've really seen a lot of uh, mayors and also just everyday people in communities um, that have stood up and said, this is, this is the right thing for us. I mean, there is a, a movement of welcomers in communities, um, certainly in the US and all over the world. Um, and I think we're uh, getting closer to the point where those collective efforts become uh, both a tipping point in communities, but also a tipping point globally, uh, where people recognize that this is both the right thing to be doing and also the economically pragmatic thing to be doing. There are a lot of challenges facing Syrians in the GTA, um, and you have an eye on kind of a lot of different moving pieces. So if you were to flag like one urgent challenge facing refugees in Toronto or the GTA, like what would it be for the people in this room who might be able to work on it? Sure. Um, well, I'd go back to this issue of chronic underemployment. Um, you know, the, a lot of the Syrian newcomers that are coming are very strong in trade skills. Uh, we have a shortage of that here. You know, so how do we match those up together in a way that's not gonna take a year, two years, three years, and you know, they, they go to positions that are, um, you know, the taxi drivers and et cetera. Um, my question is about the relationship between these uh, amazing volunteer initiatives, such as Lifeline Syria and what's going on in Guelph, and even the Welcoming America initiative, um, and how that what is the relationship between those initiatives and the settlement sector, the organizations that focus on receiving immigrants already, providing language classes, settlement services, and the like, particularly the ones in the Canadian context? Are you working with the settlement sector a lot? Or are, you, are your initiatives completely independent? Because it sounded like they were just parallel from what you were, what you were saying. Well, we, the settlement sector does do some services, some translation. If there's a formal translation of a lease, a legal document, a uh, health thing, we use them. They do, do excellent testing and whatnot. We take the stuff they do and we go to the next step. So they um, make sure that the basics are looked after. Uh, they're also reasonably overworked. So it's not like they have a lot of extra um, time to, to do, and if we can get our volunteers to uh, to take some of that burden. On English as a second language, they also have limits. Like we, we're doing you know, ESL for people over 50. We're doing ESL on the weekends. We do ESL in the evenings. We do ESL um, half an hour in the morning before work, half an hour after work. We're, you, do, you do the things that, that are too entrepreneurial. Like, yes, they might do that at some time, but they, they're, they're way too um, bureaucratic. So we have to fill in entrepreneurially the stuff that they don't don't or can't do. That's what I do. Yeah, I think it's very much the same uh, in, in Toronto. It's not uh, working uh, separately, the settlement agencies and the volunteer initiatives, but collaboratively together. Um, a lot of the settlement agencies are doing fantastic work, but they are at capacity. You know, in Toronto alone, I think it's close to 3,000 uh, refugees that have already arrived. Um, so it's really how do we both work together fill in any gaps that uh, we're seeing and really set up these refugees, these newcomers, uh, for success by working together and not recreating the wheel. Rachel? Um, and I'll just say, you know, the one of the biggest barriers to actually creating a welcoming community is uh, that in a lot of places, while there are a lot of disparate and strong efforts happening, um, there hasn't really been uh, a coordinated uh, an integrated uh, ecosystem of people, programs, um, services, resources um, to really support a vision of a more inclusive community. So um, I don't believe in doing more with less. <laughs> I think we can do more with more. Um, and I think if we can come to the table as a community around this issue in new ways, uh, we can get there. Is your success partly based on the fact that you are located in a smaller jurisdiction? I do believe that part of the, how easy it is for us to do is because of the small, small size of yeah, the community, yeah. which means 
the most expensive thing, housing, is less expensive, and it means it's such a small um, city. That I, I've been uh, in that community for uh, forever. I know everybody, and everybody knows me. It's because it's, it's a small city, so I can call friends that you that I've seen over the years at every single event and whatnot. So that does make it easier. I do agree with that. The first year is going to pass by very quickly. Do you have, uh, is your commitment uh, going to extend be beyond the first year since refugees arrived? And if so, what's the plan? Yeah, well, uh, the mandate of Lifeline Syria is to settle a thousand uh, Syrian refugees over two years, in fact. Um, but, you know, at, at that point, strong bonds are made between the um, private sponsors and the Syrian newcomers. Uh, so, so that's the beauty of the relationship. Um, but really, it's how do we ensure that in a year that they're self-sufficient, that we have, you know, that the private sponsors have empowered them throughout the process. Um, so I think that is that is going to be key. How far ahead are you planning um, when you're when you're you know kind of figuring out how Duran is responding to these refugees? Are you planning a year ahead? Are you planning five years ahead? We don't plan. <laughs> you just do. <laughs> we, we have to, to make new experiences. And, and um, we have some experiences for, from the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so we, we try to, to use these, this, but we don't know if everything works. I think it's it's really interesting because in, in the last years we had only few schools with um, a strategy strategy of um, uh, integration, mm -hmm. and now every school has to to uh, create a, its own strategy. And so I think with the schools we will we are in, in, on a good way. We and have some problems also with employment, mm -hmm. and we don't know if we we get them in in work because it's more difficult than we expected. 